summarized in three minutes. Okay. So this is an important part of learning. It's, uh, you're very comfortable learning at the university system. You've been through many classes and courses now for more than three years. But an important part of learning is to think back at what you've just learned and try to recall from memory. Tell a friend, uh, speak out loud to yourself, it's just you. But it's really, really important that you're able to reflect on the thing of what you've done. So in my mind, one really important thing we learned just at the end of the class on Friday was that idea that we've got constraints. We're op operating right at that boundary of a constraint and that distribution. So remember that distribution we drew on the board last time? And we said for many real processes, we're operating right on the boundary, which we cannot go beyond, because we cannot move to the side. But about processing, we had to draw a histogram of my control variable. This is a histogram. <coughs> of my control variable, so that's the terminology we learned last week. But that histogram must have its tail right at that constraint. Many real processes we have that constraint. Here's an example of that constraint. This week, weekend, you'd be walking on sidewalks, right, and they're icy. What happens to your speed on an icy sidewalk? Right, so you go just as fast as you can go, so that you don't slip. If you walk at a regular pace, guaranteed you'll fall. Okay, you'll slip. That's the constraint. We don't want to slip on that sidewalk. There's a boundary of your speed. So you walk just fast enough so that you can walk in a reasonable way to get you where you want to go without meeting that constraint. Okay? Many real processes are exactly the same. Our best profit, our best region of operation is right at that boundary. We don't want to go over the edge. Okay? So our process control systems, one of their important objectives are to keep us controlled, this controlled variable at that point so that we the next important objective of that control system is to make sure we can pull that standard deviation of various in. We can make that distribution narrower and narrower. And out of the narrow distribution, I can then move closer to that constraint and get near the higher population. So the three important things we learned about last week, in my opinion. So there are a few other details, some terminology that we learned about as well. Obviously, is so let's talk about today's class.
how do you answer that question to one of your colleagues who's in electrical engineering? They hear this word, perhaps, they're working in the same company as you. Chemical engineers are always saying steady state this, steady state that. The guy asks, what is steady state? How do you describe that? Okay, so one definition suggested is nothing's changing with respect to time. Does that sound fair? Be reasonable? No? No agreements? Disagreements? Everyone's sitting still Monday morning, 8 or 30. Nothing's changing with respect to time. So maybe what is Let's say I go build this control system. 
with the valves, the controller, the sensor, and the outputs. And I apply it to process A. Okay, so many companies you'll see this, guarantee the co-op work term. There'll be two or three or four reactors lined up in a row. They look identical. The valves, equipment, everything on them is identical. They're just labeled 101, 102, 103, 104, side by side. Can I take the control system and replace that and move it over to the next reactor? Reactor 102 or Reactor 103. Um, I, I think it depends on the conditions that the reactor is running under. So, like the set point may be different for reactor for process 101 than it is for 102. Okay. So, if you just took that exact same um, the exact same conditions and just put it on the other reactor, I don't think that's the. Okay. So, depending on the reactor and what it's doing. You will, this one will not be appropriate. Yeah. Okay. Another question. That's 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 a fair. That's great. That's a truth. This is a heat exchanger, and I designed it for this reason. Can I replace that heat exchanger with a CSTR and the same control? So intuitively, we already know we cannot do that. If we could do that, there would be no job for control engineers. Right? Because one person would design the control system, you go put it everywhere, the same thing. So a control system, this everything here in orange, is very, very dependent on this part of the process. And so if you don't know what the process is, you don't have a way to describe your process, then you cannot design a controller. So the description of your process, any mathematical description or some way of talking about your process is required so that you can go do all this other work here in Orange. And because we cannot simply interchange control systems and put them on different so the control system that's keeping this air temperature in the room at about 22 degrees is not appropriate to control a methanol plug flow reactor. And it's not appropriate to control a heat exchanger. So a control system, the sensors and all of the other technology around it cannot be simply copy and pasted onto different units. We have to understand what's going on in here in order to design that process. This diagram we saw last week, let's take a look at that as an example, just to further emphasize this point. This operator is standing here, we said last week the operator is trying to keep the temperature at a certain set point by adjusting the valve. And after a couple of hours of doing this, the operator realizes, hang on, if I open this valve by 1%, the temperature goes up by 1 degree. So if the temperature is too low, let's say it's five degrees lower than it needs to be, the operator realizes quickly, okay, I can just open the valve by 5%, and the temperature is going to raise by five degrees. But how long is that going to take for that action the operator makes before the temperature changes? What are, what are some of the things that it's going to depend on? Operator makes a change to the process, an input change. The output is the temperature. What's going on in here? What is this going to be a function of? What are we going to need to know about the process in order to answer the question? The resonance time of like your whole system, or like the speed of um, your coolant going through. 
Okay, so the time or the flow rate of this cold water coming in, so the residence time that that cold water spends in the... Is there anything else we'll need to know? The temperature of the incoming stream, absolutely. Anything else we will need to know? The material properties of the piping. Material properties of the piping, why, why might that be important? Conductivity, which then leads to how fast the temperature changes. So it all comes back to time and dynamics. Heat transfer coefficients, materials of construction, conductivity, heat capacity, radiation, heat transfer, difference of temperature raised to the power of four. There's radiation heat transfer, there's convection, there's conduction. All of those need to be understood so we can give an idea, get an idea of how that input affects the output. Okay, so the operator builds a model in his or her head, realizing that the 1% one, 1 change in the valve leads to 1 degree. But notice there's a whole lot more in between that actually takes place. As we said, there's heat transfer, temperatures of the cooling water, flow rates of that water. What is the what is the chemical composition of the fuel gas so we can calculate the amount of heat released when we, when we combust it. So there's a lot more going on behind the scenes, but ultimately we can boil it down to one important thing. If we open this valve by 1%, we see a 1 degree increase. So we could go to a lot of complexity and build a model of all that chemical engineering first principles, or we can simply do what? If we wanted to be lazy, because none of us want to look up heat transfer coefficients again, right? And go to our three A notes. So if we wanted to be lazy, what could you do? If your only goal was to figure out what fuel gas is affected on temperature, what could you do? Can you try testing it yourself? Testing it yourself. So different inputs. Okay, so suggestion is to test with different inputs. Specifically, what would you do if you had to tell your operator to go do this? What would you tell him or her to go do? So increase the fuel and see how the temperature changes. Okay, so move that valve, change the fuel flow rate, and see the effect on temperature. That will save you a whole lot of modeling. Will it or won't it? At the end, how are you going to get a model or a description of that input to that output? Right. You want to know here yeah, my input is sent open. I want to put that into some function, and that's going to give me degree C. How might that look? Uh, you can take a time range, say like up 35 minutes, you changing the valve, and then draw a graph of time which is common temperature change there is. Okay. okay, so we can draw graphs that show changes in percent opening and see the response on degree Celsius. We can build equations that can show, I mean, if the valve is this much open, this is the amount of increase in temperature that we get. So we're, that's where we're heading with this over the next two, three classes, is to try and get that sort of understanding. Now, the past 20 minutes of question and answer that I just had with you guys might seem like a waste of time. Okay. But my goal here in this course is not to repeat Dr. Marlin's textbook and write it up on the board for you so that you can copy it back into your notes. There's no point. Like, I have tremendous respect for you that I know you can read textbooks. Okay? So my time in the class spent with you is to interpret what's in the textbook. So, these sorts of questions and answers will be in every single lecture. If you get frustrated with that type of understanding or learning, then you, you can simply read the textbook, right? That's, that's quite okay. If you're comfortable reading, which you all are, then let's spend our time here interacting and talking about and thinking about what these processes are doing. Okay, so that's my goal with any of my lectures, is to interpret what's going on. So I'm just saying that, so that you, you are on the same you know what I'm about in this lecture. Okay, so let's uh, let's work that way.
Now, if that's our goal, is to build these dynamic descriptions of the process, what form will that description take? We already had it said, mentioned at the start of the class. What, is the, what are those models going to look like? They've got to be a function of time. Okay. We know we need time in them. If you had to generate these models, we're going to have to resort to differential equations. Okay. Differential equations are going to be the basis for all this work. So let's take a look at how we do that. And as no surprise, and because you, I know it's not a surprise because you've seen it in 3D, and I've seen your lecture notes in 3D because I speak with Dr. Adams, so I know what he's taught you, that we're going to do balances. We're going to do mass balances and energy balances, momentum balances if necessary, to build balances. So if we want to come up with a model of our process from the input to the output, we're going to use differential equation models. And the way they work is very simple, the most general form. The general form of that balance is, let's say, accumulation. I'm going to call it S. We'll talk about what S is in a minute. Is equal to flow in of S minus the flow out <coughs> of S plus the rate of creating S minus the rate of destroying or removing S or consuming. Rate of consumption of S. Now S here is left generic because it can be, let's just make a note here, S can be typically mass, that would be, seem to be the most common one that we work with, accumulation of mass is mass in minus mass out plus rate which are creating mass minus rate of consumption. So S could be mass, it could be mass of a certain species, let's call it species I, so species like methanol for example, hydrogen, H2O, steam, water, so it could be either, S could be either the total mass of the system, and we emphasize that by writing total mass, mass of an individual species, or <coughs> S could be total energy. So those are typically the three balances we might perform on the system to give the dynamic. <coughs> and let's just make one important note about that. When you're doing this modeling, let's just write here, check <coughs> That's the most important part of this, is to ensure that your units are the same in every single term. Flow in is easy to find the units. So once you know the units of flow in of a certain mass or of a certain species I, flow out must be in those same units, rate of creation, rate of consumption must be in those same units, and then particularly this term over here on the left hand side. That's usually the one that people mess up is that the units for accumulation are then have to be consistent with what's on the right hand side. Okay, so this all sounds very heavy and, and, and it is general a very general uh, form. So let's take a look at a specific example.
So an example we'll take is a tank. Where we're feeding that tank with some flow rate in. And we've got leaving here flow rate out. So we're going to look at this example pretty much for the rest of the lecture. So let's, uh, let's understand what's going on in here. Flow rate in, flow rate out. And this tank has a certain height, H. So I'm going to ask you to spend three minutes to answer the following question. Dynamic model for height H. Okay, so spend three, four minutes, work with the person around you, and apply what you've just learned over there on the right hand side board to answer that question on the left. the shape of the tank? Does it matter? You say it's triangular. No. <laughs> no, but does it matter? Yeah. Really? Maybe it's exciting. Like the 
Hexagonal, it has a cross sectional area. Let's call it A. So, one of our unknowns here is A, the cross sectional area. Are we to assume that doesn't change? Okay, so that's going to be our next step. So, we've got a cross sectional area. If the tank's walls are vertical, does the cross sectional area change with time? No. Okay? So, if the tank was sloped, Absolutely, the cross-sectional area changes, and then our analysis is more involved. But we're going to see that in the next, when we start to study it. So we need an unknown A, and A could be a function of height, or it may be constant, so it's not a function of height. So the most general form is to write A of H. You can say, well, I'm assuming, or I know by just looking at the tank, that it does not have an area that changes the height, so we can just simply write A. And let's say A is equal to 0.5 meters squared. For this assumption. A few people were also talking about initial conditions. Where did the initial conditions go? happens with ODEs and initial conditions. 3E was only four weeks ago. You can't have forgotten this already. 
Math 2Z I know was a little longer ago, but this is still stuff that you've seen regularly, right? Every course has used ODEs. So what happens with our initial conditions? How do we express them? H of zero equals something. And initial conditions don't go here, plus H of zero. Okay, so a few people were writing down ODEs and then adding an initial value here at the end. Okay? We don't have that in ODEs. Okay, in ODEs, we write a new equation, H of zero equals, let's say, four meters. So it's a new equation, it's not added on to this general balance. Okay, so let's, uh, let's take a look at this general balance. Accumulation of S. And S is what is the most suitable for S in this problem. Volume. Uh, do we have volume here? Can we do a, a conservation equation on volume? Yes. In general, can we create an equation that describes the conservation of volume? Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Okay. Yes. No. Absolutely not. The only time we can do a conservation on volume is when? Constant density. But in general, you cannot. So we're conserving mass. Mass is conserved. Accumulation of mass. How does that term look like? Sorry? Dm by dt. Dm by dt. Okay. What is m? Total mass. Total mass is equal to your boss asks you what's the mass in the tank. Your answer is mass is equal to volume times the density. The m by dt is equal to what is volume equal to? H times a. H times area. So let's expand that even further then. Rho h a by dt. So we've got our left hand side. Right-hand side. Let's maybe ask, just before we move on there, we had said this, we made this earlier comment, check the units. What are the units on the right-hand side? Do a quick unit check. How do you do units of the derivative? Yeah. <coughs> derivative have units? Yes? No? Okay, derivatives always have units, integrals have units. So the units here are the densities units are kilograms per meter cubed. Units of height are meters. Units of area are meters squared. And then our denominator has units of time seconds. So a quick unit check shows that meters cube cancels and we're left with kilograms per second. So whatever we put on the right hand side over there must also have units of kilograms per second. Okay. Conversely, many of you started on the left on the right hand side and wrote flow in because that's an easy one to work with. But then you need to make sure that those units matched over there. Okay. 
So we started on the left hand side, we got units of kilograms per second. That's mass rate of force change in the system. So if we had to run out the left hand the right hand side, you need to excuse me, I get left and right mixed up. If we had to run out the right hand side, flow in of S, how would you express that? Because we said F flow in F in is volumetric, then we have to do rho times F in. Rho times F in. Okay, so I, I'm seeing a few people that are, have obviously solved this. If you've solved it, go ahead and integrate that so long while the rest of us catch up to this point. Okay, so integrate that in the meantime. The rest of us, let's take a look at flow out of S. What is flow out of S? Rho times F out. Okay, now the next important question, whenever we're faced with a derivative, and before we start simplifying it, we have to figure out what terms change with respect to our independent variable. What do we mean by an independent variable? Which is the independent variable in that equation? Time. Okay. This guy is my independent variable. Which terms in that equation change with time? H. H changes with time. Okay, for sure. Okay, so H changes with time. Anything else? Nothing? Are you assuming nothing or do you know that it's nothing else changing? Okay, so assume density is constant and doesn't change with time. Assume area is constant and doesn't change with time. But now be careful here because the moment you make that assumption, we've already established H changes with time. So now we also need to check that the variables don't change with H. Okay, so density doesn't change as a function of H. Area doesn't change as a function of H. Remember, we've decided that earlier on, our tank walls are vertical. But if the tank walls were not vertical, area would be a function of h. And so we need to be careful when we're making that assumption over there. So area we're assuming does not change with h nor with time. Density doesn't change with height or time. Flow rate n, does that change with time? Yes, no, we can, okay, so what we can do is we can lock it down and say it doesn't change with time, or we can tell how it changes with time. Okay, so let's for this example say F F 0 0.8 meters cubed per second. If it changed with time, I would need to say F N of T is equal to some function of time, but if we say it's constant, let's just use for this example 0.8. F out, does that change with time? Does it change with H? Yeah. <coughs> In general, what would your expectation be of the change of F out with respect to time or with height? The greater the height, the greater the flow rate out. Okay. So typically what we can do is we can express that and form F out is equal to H over R. So it's equal to the height divided by some resistance R. So that piping over here, there will typically be a valve, and even if it's somewhat open, will provide a resistance so that the material leaving experiences that resistance and that will be in proportion to the height h. Okay. So
So if we write that out now, we can just expand this term is equal to rho fn minus rho h over r. And then how do we simplify that ODE? Take a minute, write out the new simplified ODE with taking all this discussion into account. We'll give you a minute to do that. So write, simplify the ODE as much as you can. Okay. So best guess is for H of T next time is not the final. 